movement. It is the government, the, the regime, is a mature polity, I would argue, increasingly capable of taking rational decisions um, to promote its national self, its national interest, to act instrumentally and rationally to promote the, the interests of, of Iran as a nation state, and particularly to protect itself and to look at its, um, its legitimate security concerns and to take steps to protect itself. That's, I think, a really important way to try to look at Iran. In contrast, the predominant conventional uh, wisdom here in Washington, the way a lot of people look at Iran, without very much evidence, I'd say with no evidence, is that Iran is, is, is ideologically driven, bent on becoming history's first suicide nation, that they're going to develop a nuclear weapons uh, program and actually use nuclear weapons um, in a way that's not deterrable. A first use, a first use uh, they're going to actually use them in a, in a first use situation. We have no evidence of that. You know, in, in contrast, when you look at Iran's, how Iran um, behaved during the Iran-Iraq War in the 1980s, an eight-year war where more than half a million Iranians were killed, in part with Saddam Hussein using chemical weapons against them, the Iranians decided, took a decision. We actually, you know, now there is archival material that shows um, some of the debate within the Iranian leadership. They took a decision not to use chemical weapons back against the, the Iraqis. So we actually have some sense of an ability by the Iranians to take um, to take some pretty severe hits and to not uh, not not go first to to some sort of unconventional weapons. Um, option to use against even its archest uh, foes like Iraq was during the 1980s. So you have this idea here in Washington that Iran is, is ideologically driven to become history's first suicide nation, with I think very little, if no evidence, to, to substantiate that, versus what I see as really a, an Iranian polity 30 years later, 30 years after the revolution, that is increasingly capable of taking rational steps. Um, and to act re instrumentally to promote its national interest. And in that regard, the way I think it's critically important to look at Iran today, for this administration to look at Iran, is through ir what Iran says are their legitimate security interests, their legitimate security concerns. And for this administration to try to get at those legitimate security concerns and to, pr to provide Iran with security guarantees um, to, to, to try to meet those security concerns. Now, here in Washington, for any administration to give the Iranian government, this Iranian government that supports groups like Hamas and Hezbollah, to give that government security guarantees would be anathema. It just wouldn't be possible the way our, our politics are configured here. And it wouldn't make much sense if Iran was to continue to support groups um, that took actions, sometimes violent, against, uh, against Americans or American allies. So to me, the critical um, the way to look at this, to unlock it, to unpack it, to get through this kind of Gordian knot, is to firmly put on the table that we are willing to give Iran security guarantees, and we can go into um, how do you make that tangible, give Iran security guarantees. And Iran would need to commit to, stop, to not provide weapons or money to groups that, uh, that could take violent uh, could 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 uh, take violent uh, steps, violent attack violently the United States, Americans, or our allies. To me, that's kind of the core of the bargain, and it um, it would then be the basis of a grand bargain that would deal with all of the issues that are of concern to Iran and concern to, of concern to the United States. There, it would be very similar to the way that the United States and China fundamentally reoriented their relationship back in the early 1970s. There wasn't a question of, you know, China had to become a nice, gentle country, that Mao had to leave office, that we couldn't deal with him. None of these questions that you hear um, similarly said about Iran. We didn't do that with China. We basically recognized China as an important country with its own self, with its own national interests, and we struck a grand bargain with them for fundamental rapprochement. I, I think we really need to do the same thing with, the, with Iran today. Hillary Mann Leverett, uh, the elections that are coming up in Iran. Uh, who is running and the significance of Ahmadinejad right now, uh, his popularity or not within Iran? You know, it's interesting, almost, uh, not almost, every president in Iran since the advent of the Islamic Republic in 1979 has, every president has had two terms. They're term limited, which, you know, it's interesting because we often um, rebuke Iran as a, as a dictatorial uh, country, as an autocratic state. But in fact, they've had elections. Um, 
every, you know, every four years since, since the advent of the Islamic Republic, and every president has, has had two terms. The, um, the democratic process, the election process, is seriously flawed, as, as your prior guest, Jane Abadi, uh, very articulately laid out. But it is an important process. It is a competitive process. It is not a sure thing. Um, so, for example, when Ahmadinejad ran, um, ran last time and was elected as president, he was the dark horse. He was nobody's chosen candidate, not even the supreme leader, as we sometimes hear. And before him, uh, the reformist, um, President Khatami, was elected also in a surprise election. But Khatami, even though he was elected by, in a surprise election with no very almost no support from the clerical establishment, he stayed for two terms. So here we have Ahmadinejad, who I think also came to office and pretty much um, as the dark horse candidate. I, I think he probably is going to serve another term. I think that has more to do with, um, as we see sometimes in this country, a certain kind of uh, lethargy within the populace, um, uh, not a very dynamic uh, political debate. Um, and a, a sense, I think, from the supreme leader and the, the clerical establishment that it's probably good for Iran, for its stability, to have a president uh, serve for two terms. So I think there's a built-in inst institutional uh, bias in favor of um, just letting the president stay for two terms. He's term limited anyway. He'll be out in another four years. So I think that probably the odds are that even with Ahmadinejad taking some hits um, in his popularity over the past couple of years, particularly uh, because the economic situation, I think the odds are that he still will uh, will be reelected in June. He does have some competitors. Um, the mayor of Tehran, who has a similar background to Ahmadinejad, um, you know, Ahmadinejad actually was the mayor of Tehran before he became uh, president. Uh, this person, his name is Khalibaf. He is the mayor of Tehran, is looked at as a, as a pragmatic conservative, a technocrat, similarly to how Ahmadinejad was actually viewed before he was elected president. Khalibaf has, um, has strong ties to the Revolutionary Guard, as um, Ahmadinejad did. Uh, does as well. So the two of them, sometimes people say, well, Khalibaf is going to be a more pragmatic conservative. We often hear that here in the West because I think there's a lot of wishful thinking that somehow we're going to get somebody more to our liking um, in the polity rather than uh, looking frankly uh, and transparently at what needs to be done um, substantively between the U.S. and Iran. But there's a I think there's a great tendency here to try to, to see who's going to be a good player. I don't think Khalibaf is going to be much better for us in terms of being someone who's more pliable than Ahmadinejad, but he'll be another uh, candidate, perhaps. Um, there's some discussion about a reformist candidate running, potentially even the former president, Khatami. Um, that, that may happen. He's giving some signals that, that he would come back in. But he was, um, he was similarly constrained during his term in office. I don't think he's going to be um, some sort of pro-American uh, stealth candidate coming into office that we can, we can say, oh, as long as he's, he's elected, we'll be fine. Um, Hillary so Manlever, we have to wrap, the, but I <laughs> do want to ask if you see a real shift with uh, President Obama's administration. I don't. I think you'll probably see a lot of a, a continuation of the Bush second term, a policy potentially that Bush first term, second term was carrots and sticks. I think Obama is going to try to pursue more carrots, more sticks, which I think will not change the strategic calculation inside Iran. The strategic calculation, I think, is one of, um, of, of self-protection for the country, for the state. And that basic self-defense strategic calculation is not going to be altered by some more economic goodies um, in terms of carrots. We're going to have to leave um, it there. Hiller Mann, Leverett, Middle East Analyst, thanks for joining us. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks for joining us on Democracy Now! This is Democracy Now! DemocracyNow.org.